Before we get started, because I always like to introduce myself just a little bit. Um, my name is Patricia Hainan. They call me Pat, and pleased to do the same. Um, I have never met your rector, but I love her already, having corresponded with her a bunch. Uh, she's a terrific person, and you're very fortunate. Um, and I hope you all think so. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not taking names about that, though. Um, the other thing is, for most of my 30-odd years of, or and odd is the right word, of ordained ministry, um, I worked in the Diocese of Ohio as congregational director for the diocese, congregational development director for the diocese. And so I went to a bunch of churches all over the northern half of Ohio. And when I got out of seminary, I thought I knew what an Episcopal service was supposed to look like. But after I had done that rotation for a while, I had absolutely no idea. So when I no longer have any ego at all invested in how the service goes or anything else, or even how egregiously I make mistakes myself. So the one thing I tell congregations always, where I am not there a lot, is, or have never been before, is please, if I'm wandering off into outer space and not doing anything the way you do it or the way you expect it to be done, do not suffer in silence. Um, <laughs> I am totally serious, and you hear me, Mr. Organist, back there. Um, if I start out doing something totally weird, wave your arms about and say, no, we don't do it that way here. It's perfectly all right to tell me that. It's not all right to tell your rector when she first comes or any of that, but it's perfectly okay to tell me. We don't do it like that. I am not invested, and I am delighted to be with you this morning. Thank you. You're welcome. Our service will begin eventually, I promise, on page 355 in the Book of Common Prayer. Blessed be God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And blessed be his kingdom, and now and forever. Amen. Almighty God, to you all hearts are open, all desires known, and from you no secrets are hid. Cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit, that we may perfectly love you and worthily magnify your holy name, through Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen.
The Lord be with you. And also with you. Let us pray. Grant us, O Lord, to trust in you with all our hearts, for as you always resist the proud who confide in their own strength, so you never forsake those who make their boast of your mercy. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Amen. Let's be seated for the scripture. A reading from Jeremiah. The word that came to Jeremiah from the Lord, Come, go down to the potter's house, and there I will let you hear my words. So I went down to the potter's house, and there he was working at his wheel. The vessel he was making of clay was spoiled in the potter's hand, and he reworked it into another vessel, as seemed good to him. Then the word of the Lord came to me, Can I not do with you, O house of Israel, just as this potter has done? says the Lord. Just like the clay in the potter's hand, so are you in my hand, O house of Israel. At one moment I may declare concerning a nation or a kingdom that I will pluck up and break down and destroy it. But if that nation concerning which I have spoken turns from its, from its evil, I will change my mind about the disaster that I intended to bring on it. And at another moment, I may declare concerning a nation or a kingdom that I will build and plant it. But if it does evil in my sight, not listening to my voice, then I will change my mind about the good that I had intended to do it. Therefore, say to the people of Judah and the inhabitants of, Jer of Jerusalem, thus says the Lord, look, I'm a potter shaping evil against you and devising a plan against you. Turn now all of you from your evil way and amend your ways and your doings. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God.
A reading from Philemon. Paul, a prisoner of Christ Jesus, and Timothy, our brother, to Philemon, our dear friend and co-worker, to Apphia, our sister, to Archippus, our fellow soldier, and to the church in your house. Grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. When I remember you in my prayers, I always thank my God because I hear of your love for all the saints and your faith toward the Lord Jesus. I pray that the sharing of your faith may become effective when you perceive all the good that we may do for Christ. I have indeed received much joy and encouragement from your love because the hearts of the saints have been refreshed through you, my brother. For this reason, though I am bold enough in Christ to command you to do your duty, yet I would rather appeal to you on the basis of love, and I, Paul, do this as an old man, and now also as a prisoner of Jesus Christ. I am appealing to you for my child, Onesimus, whose father I have become during my imprisonment. Formerly he was useless to you, but now he is indeed useful both to you and to me. I am sending him, that is, my own heart, back to you. I wanted to keep him with me so that he might be of service to me in your place during my imprisonment for the gospel. But I preferred to do nothing without your consent in order that your good deed might be voluntary and not something forced. Perhaps this is the reason he was separated from you for a while so that you might have him back forever, no longer as a slave, but more than a slave, a beloved brother, especially to me, but how much more to you both in the flesh and in the Lord. So if you consider me your partner, welcome him as you would welcome me. If he has wronged you in any way or owes you anything, charge that to my account. I, Paul, am writing this with my own hand. I will repay it. I say nothing about your, your owing me even your own self. Yes, brother, let me have this benefit from you in the Lord. Refre refresh my heart in Christ. Confident of your obedience, I am writing to you, knowing that you will do even more than I say. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Gospel of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ according to Luke. Glory to you, Lord Christ. Now large crowds were traveling with Jesus, and he turned and said to them, Whoever comes to me and does not hate father and mother, wife and children, brothers and sisters, yes, and even life itself, cannot be my disciple. Whoever does not carry the cross and follow me cannot be my disciple. For which of you, intending to build a tower, does not first sit down and estimate the cost to see whether he has enough to complete it? Otherwise, when he has laid a foundation and is not able to finish, all who see it will begin to ridicule him, saying, This fellow began to build and was not able to finish. 
Or what king going out to wage war against another king will not sit down first and consider whether he is able with 10,000 to oppose the one who comes against him with 20,000? If he cannot, then while the other is still far away, he sends a delegation and asks for the terms of peace. So therefore, none of you can become my disciple if you do not give up all your possessions. This is the Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, Lord Christ. May the words of my mouth and the meditations of all our hearts be always acceptable in your sight, O God, our strength and our Redeemer. Amen. Please have a seat. One of the other things I learned in going to and fro in the Diocese of Ohio is that you should always bring a handout, so I did. Check what time it is, okay. Do you know that in China, <laughs> this is not part of the sermon, but I'm just thinking of it. Do you know that in China, they put a clock in the back of the church so that the priest can actually see the clock and figure out what's going on? <laughs> now that sounds like a wonderful idea until I tell you that they preach for an hour. <laughs> One solid, complete hour. Now, you have trouble staying awake uh, for however long a sermon here normally takes, but imagine it for an hour in Chinese. Mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, yes, ma'am, exactly. And the Chinese take notes. And when you have preached there, as I had the occasion to do on several, several times, um, they take notes on your sermon, and then you're expected to autograph them. Priests are literally rock stars. They present you with this piece of paper. Um, and it took, I said, the sermon is normally an hour? Yes, the guy told me. I said, okay, fine, I'll preach for 25 minutes, and then you translate it for half an hour, and we'll be, uh, <laughs> no, we'll, we'll be in the time that people expect. And they will say, well, she's too bad, she didn't have enough to say, but, you know, on the other hand, it won't, uh, it won't be too awful. Well. That has nothing to do with this morning's gospel, so now you can forget it. But what this morning's gospel and this morning's reading from the book of Jeremiah and the letter to Philemon have in common is that they all tell us what God expects from us. God expects us to be God's people first, first and last and always. They all say it slightly differently. Jeremiah, in his lovely prophetic voice, the way Jeremiah kind of always and all the prophets always kind of work things, he says, God will get you for this if you don't do it. Um, if you don't figure out what I want you to do and hew close to it, I'm going to change the work of my hands and I'm going to shape an entirely different pot on this wheel. You are my people, you're supposed to do what I say, and if you don't, I'm going to punish you. That's the message of the prophets. Jesus, in the Gospel, says, here I am among you, I love you, I am one of you, you see me every day, you see in me what God means for you to be and do, and I expect you, if you are going to be my disciple, to let go of virtually everything else. Now we don't do that, but I'll come back 
to that in a minute. But what he says, he is very clear about in the Gospel of Luke. He says, whoever comes to me and does not hate father and mother, wife and children, brothers and sisters, yes, and even life itself, cannot be my disciple. And that word hate that he uses there doesn't mean, you know, I'm going to rage at you the way I rage at the television, uh, you know, some of the time. It means I am going to not consider you. I am going to put you second or even last in my considerations. That's what that word means there. So if you don't downplay those things that most of us learn right from the get-go to prioritize in our lives, if we don't do that, we cannot be God's disciple or Jesus' disciple. Well, this is hard doctrine indeed. And then the quintessential line, whoever does not carry the cross, not just what I consider to be my cross, but the cross, that one, um, and follow me, cannot be my disciple. So, following Jesus leads to the cross. That too is hard doctrine. We don't like to hear those things and we don't like to focus on those things. So the church has done its best to kind of dress things up a little differently. The church has done its best to sort of tell us that if we are good, decent people, come to church, are here Sunday mornings, do what we're supposed to do, God loves us just fine and we don't have to change anything else. Well, that's not what this scripture says and it's not the truth of the matter and I get to say that because I'm here as a visitor and if I get ridden out of town on a rail, well, um, <laughs> it's what I deserve for venturing out of my house. You know, that's, that's, that's what happens. Um, None of you can become my disciple if you do not give up all your possessions. Okay. Uh, a person this morning told me, uh, and that person shall be nameless, that when it's hot like this and they wear stuff uh, like this, which is a portable steam cabinet, they're, <laughs> they're underneath in their underwear. Okay? Um, that's not something that the church tells us we should do. That's an accommodation that we make uh, in the church, and it may or may not embarrass us as we go along, but we make that our way of dealing with what the church does. We live with it in a way that makes us rather more comfortable when it's hot. <laughs> and according to what um, the scripture tells us it can get very hot very fast if you don't do what God wants. And somehow what you're wearing isn't the issue. The church makes us feel as comfortable as we can, I think. And it does this through its ceremonies and its beautiful music and everything. Um, and we think of being in heaven as church only more so. with more beautiful stuff around. But we don't focus on the fact that to get there we have to do some stuff that's hard. And that's the purpose of my handout. Let me ask you something. What did Jesus actually do while he was alive? 